Okay, um, thank you for the invitation to give this talk uh, to essentially uh, Andre Dorogostov and to Georgi, I think, uh, who would organize the seminar, if I understand correctly. The seminar is called uh, Maya Learn Calculus. So my, uh, this paper that I shall present has a little bit of Maya Learn Calculus in the end because we will discuss um, derivative formulas for heat tunnels. And some people like to do this uh, by using Maya Learn Calculus. And we will use it in a way too. Uh, we will use it in the form of the so-called bismuth derivative formula for heat kernels, which involves uh, some sort of path integrals. So in the end, you will have some minor calculus in the end. Okay, so this is joint work with a young fellow from Humboldt University Berlin. His name is Bartu Gunesu. He's a German guy of Turkish origin. And he's, a, he's really a very smart and very nice guy. Whenever you have the chance to see him or to invite him, please do so. I, I think he's a very interesting mathematician and a very nice gentleman. Mm -hmm. And Batsu is an expert on mathematical physics and he is an expert uh, on all kinds of things that uh, come with Schrodinger operators. And recently he started also doing stochastic analysis in the context of Schrodinger operators and uh, that's how we met and uh, we started this project. Okay, so the title is Molecules as Metric Measure Spaces with Lower Ricci Cantor Curvature. That's, the title is cheating of this, of this paper because we try to combine two things which are not necessarily completely connected, but of course we try to make the point that there is some connection. Um, and uh, I, I will try to convince you that there is some connection here in, in fact. <clears throat> and uh, so the outline of the talk is that I will first um, give you some background about uh, metric measure spaces with lower Ricci curvature bound. This is the theory of general, generalized metric spaces, which was developed in recent years by Villani, uh, Lott and Sturm and other people. And it created a lot of attention in certain domains of mathematics. And, um, and I will tell you some elements of this theory here in order to give you a possibility to understand why this is connected in the end with, with the analysis of showing operation in the case of molecules. Okay, so we start with some elementary background on geometry. I try to be quick, but uh, and I hope that, or I think that you all have excellent education, so you all are familiar with some geometry concepts, so I'll be quick, uh, but nevertheless, I'll take the time to introduce some notions. So the, the, in the talk, we have the, con the term curvature, and the curvature there are different types of uh, curvature concepts for surfaces or for manifolds. Uh, I like to work with the so-called Gaussian curvature uh, and generalizations of this in the higher dimensional case, I will, I will work with the so-called Ricci curvature, which is some average value of Gaussian curvature. So let us recall what is the Gaussian curvature of a two dimensional surface. Uh, basically you represent the surface locally uh, as as a graph over its tangent space. And as a graph over its tangent space, the, 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 uh, the, the surface is either more or less a parabola, which is to the, to the upper side or to the lower side of the, of the surface. So this is, if you like, the case of the parabola. Mm -hmm. Or you have the case of a saddle point. Mm -hmm. Or you have, if you like, the intermediate case when in one direction you have a flat direction and in the other direction you have a parabola. So this is the, the, the if you like, the intermediate case. So when you can describe your service locally as a graph of a function, then this means that the corresponding function in the development point is basically the corresponding quadratic form, which is induced by the second order derivative of this function. So you do a identify in a way the function with the corresponding second order Taylor expan expansion, which is purely a quadratic form. And what you want to, the notion of curvature then is just the product of the eigenvalues of this corresponding quadratic form. So here you have one positive eigenvalue and one negative eigenvalue in this case, because you have a parabola in one direction north and in the other direction south. And we have a plus and minus eigenvalue of this corresponding quadratic form and the product is negative. So that's why you, you call this a negative curvature situation. You have a positive eigenvalue and a negative eigenvalue of the corresponding uh, quadratic form and that's negative curvature. 
In this case here, you have a parabola or you have a, like a parabolic uh, shape in, the, in one direction and in the other direction, you have a flat function. So here, the, the function here is basically only a quadratic function in one coordinate and the other co coordinate is a zero function. In other words, one eigenvalue is zero, the other eigenvalue is positive or negative, it doesn't matter, but the product of the two is zero. So that's why this is a zero curvature situation. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you have two eigenvalues which have the same sign of this function and therefore uh, you have a positive, eigen, a positive curvature case, right? And the stronger you, the effect is, so the stronger you have a bending of the surface, then the, the bigger the absolute value of these two, uh, of, of the curvature is, right? So the sign of the curvature gives you information about whether you are in a settle point situation or you are in a really parabolic situation, that's the sign. And the absolute value of the curvature tells you how strong the curvature effect is. Mm -hmm. That's the Gaussian curvature. And in higher dimensions, you basically take some average value of all these Gaussian curvatures. This will then be called the Ricci curvature. So Gaussian curvature is for two dimensional surfaces. And Ricci curvature will be something like an average value of all two dimensional sub manifolds, if you have a manifold of higher dimension. Okay, that's the concept of curvature. Now, curvature has a profound if effect on the Brownian motion that you can construct on such manifolds. So like on Euclidean space, you can define Brownian motion on a manifold. There's different ways how to construct a Brownian motion on a manifold. One way to do it is by a central limit theorem, where the random walk, which you do on Euclidean space, is now replaced by a geodesic random walk, as it is called. So uh, you fix a certain jump size r positive, And then you start in a certain initial position. You choose among all points of distance r, which are r uh, units away in the geodesic distance of the surface. You choose at random a point and make a jump towards there. And then you iterate the whole procedure. So you get a Markov chain which jumps on the surface and which does a jump of size r at every moment of time to a randomly chosen point in the r surface or the R sphere, which is surrounding that point. This is what you would call a geodesic random walk with jump size R. So it's perfect analogy in a way of the Euclidean random walk with a fixed jump size. And then you apply to this. So for each jump size R, you have one such random walks. And now you uh, do a scaling of this collection of stochastic processes in the hydrodynamic fashion. So you send the jump size R zero, but you speed up time in a quadratic fashion. And this whole thing, this process then by some typical arguments, which involve compactness of processes and finally an identification of the limit, that this will then have a unique limit. And this unique limit is what you call a Brownian motion on this uh, manifold. So of course the, the limiting process will be something like this. That's then the Brownian motion on the manifold. And for this concept to, to con for such a thing to construct, basically you need only, so to say, you need only metric information about the space in order to be able to, well, okay, it, it would be nice if you had like uniform distribution on the spheres. So just an arbitrary metric space is probably not good enough. It should be so good that it at least has a pre proper concept of house of measure on spheres or something. Like that. But this is already an indication that some of the stuff that is going to happen here is also possible uh, on more general spaces than on smooth manifolds. And that's is, is to some extent one of the main aims of this theory that these people developed over the last 10 to 15 uh, years. Uh, Max, uh, can I interrupt you? Uh, I have a question. Uh, then uh, this limit procedure uh, yes. will give us uh, maybe some process which is uh, uh, which has properties of uh, Brownian motion locally but I think yes. that the global behavior uh, can be very different uh, from the usual uh, in the absolutely. Euclid, yeah Abs absolutely absolutely I mean just think of a sphere yeah mm, yeah yes exactly exactly mm. is a dramatic difference mm -hmm. but there's okay. also but also in a way also if you look at finer if, well Whenever you do Ito formula in a way, so there's a geometric version of Ito formula and all this mm -hmm. kind of business here in this world. Mm -hmm. 
And when you, in, in, in the ETO formula, you see second order effects. And then even on local time, on, on local time scales, you even see when you really look into second order, you see a difference towards your cleaning uh, behavior. Okay. Um, but okay, probably it's, you can discuss this. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some example. No, I, so I insist in the next theorem, We'll give you a partial answer to your question, Andre. Okay, so thank this, you. Is, this is a this is a so the next uh, theorem is something that I proved um, at the end of my PhD thesis long long time ago with my PhD advisor Theo Stor, and it makes a very uh, direct uh, connection between the curvature of the Riemannian manifold and the behavior of the Brownian motion, namely uh, the following is equivalent. So suppose you have a Riemannian manifold of arbitrary dimension and you fix a, a, um, a real number k and the following statements are equivalent. So the Ricci curvature, which is an average value in terms of uh, so average with respect to two dimensional subspaces. So basically let's talk about the two dimensional case. So in this case, Ricci will always be the same as Gaussian curvature. Okay, so think about knowing for two dimensional case. So then the curvature of this space is greater or equal to K, where K is a real number. It may be negative, but still greater or equal to this real number K. That's equivalent to saying that the corresponding diffusion semi group, so the semi group which is induced by taking expectation with respect to Brownian motion, has the following uh, Lipschitz smoothing property. Namely, you evaluate the Lipschitz correction, you evaluate the heat semi group on a, a test function f from L infinity, say, and you evaluate at two, two different positions, then this will be exponentially fast contracting towards zero, if k is positive, say, where on the right-hand side, you have the distance of the starting points. And here you have exactly this curvature bound on the, on the right-hand side. So, so you see that the, um, you have an, uh, a very visible effect on curvature on the behavior of the heat semigroup, which is basically just the expectation of Brownian motion. But there's even a more a nicer characterization of this by, by means of coupling two Brownian motions. In equivalent, you can ask or you can uh, require that for all possible starting points on this manifold, you can construct two Brownian motions. So the object which I just described through this geodesic random walk, you can consider two Brownian motions Mm -hmm. which are coupled, which are coupled, that's the point here, they are not independent. But if you look at each of them separately, they are Brownian motions, mm -hmm. such that pathwise, they converge to one another exponentially fast, where the convergence rate is exactly this, this, um, mm -hmm. this uh, rigid curvature. So you can bring two Brownian trajectories very fast together on a sphere. So um, if we go back to the sphere example, but I will draw the sphere in a second. But let me uh, just indicate for you first how you do this uh, to do this coupling. Namely, suppose this is your starting point X and this is your starting point Y and you want to construct now two guys which perform a Brownian motion but which somehow connect, are connected to one another. And then what you do to construct these couplings is you call this X guy the master so that's, if you like, is the master process. And, and the Y process is the slave process. And the slave picks or will basically repeat the definition or the choice that the master has made, but in a geometric fashion, namely whenever the, the, the Y that the slave needs to go, it will make, it will choose the shortest connection between from Y to X. And then it will, what is called, to parallel translate. So it basically will collect the choice that X has made and will basically move this choice along this connecting line in what is called parallel transport. So it is called parallel transport. If that's the, the choice that let me call this. So effectively X has made some, some speed choice V. Going to a point mm -hmm. in the neighborhood is basically choosing a speed by which you leave from your position. 
And then what, what the slave does, it goes to its master, it will record what this choice V was, and then it will move this V choice in a way which is not distorting. That's now a geometric concept, which is called parallel translation. So if I parallel translate V back, then I get some vector W. W, if you like, will be the translation of this choice of V. And this will be then the choice of the slave. And this process will continue. So now that master is here, uh, the slave has made its, its jump towards here. So, and then the process it, is iterated. So now the master makes a new decision. This is the this new decision of the master and the slave picks, uh, picks translates, if you like, the second decision of the master, if you call this V1 and this V2. And then the slave will again draw this connecting line and will transport uh, the second decision of the master to be translated, sorry, to be translated into its next, next move. That's how you connect two geodesic random walks. It is very interesting because uh, in the uh, flat situation, this military coupling uh, <laughs> does not give you a, anything uh, uh, distance which uh, tends to zero. Uh, exactly, it's, it's the K zero case. It's the K equals zero case. Yes, exactly, exactly. So uh, this no is contraction. positive curvature, they uh, goes to, to guess, they go yeah? to, Exactly. So you can see this, let me probably uh, insert. Uh, but you told that K may be negative. Oh yes, K may be negative. In this case, the, the, the statement is just that they do not uh, move away from each other with a bigger speed than this exponential speed. Okay. So, so but just for, for everyone, because I, this, is, this is one of the few things that I understood in my life. Uh, so I'd like to share this with you. So on a, on a sphere, on a sphere, what you see is this. So here's the, here's the master, here's the slave. And they are always on a grand circle. So for two points on the sphere, you always have one grand circle such that the two points lie on the grand circle. Now, if the, if the master makes a decision which is in direction of the grand circle, then the parallel translation of this direction is exactly the same direction, and the two do not change their respective difference, uh, the difference, uh, the, the distance. But if the master makes a decision which is orthogonal to this grand sphere, then what you see is that the corresponding translated decision for the slave is also this orthogonal direction. And what you see is that the guys moved together a little bit because they, want, they went inside towards a smaller distance on the sphere. And this is a second order effect. Oh. So, the, 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 so you have this parallelogram. Basically, you construct all the time, you construct small parallelograms and the curvature, may, the curvature will produce that the resulting line the, will be kind will be ma most of the cases will be shorter than the initial the baseline of this parallelogram. Okay. Okay. That's the logic here. Um, now, uh, but uh, now there is an extension of this result. Well, Max, yes. uh, can I uh, just uh, one uh, one else question about this uh, very nice, very interesting effect? Uh, mm -hmm. Suppose that we have uh, this uh, usual sphere. Uh, then, uh, uh, what you can say? Uh, uh, maybe uh, they uh, became to be close to one another, but never meet one another. Still, never yes. meet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me think. Uh, let me think. Let me think. Uh... Okay, I think this uh, here is really the capacity thing, which is the same in every dimension in a way. Many so really, really meeting is this is a, is a question of dimension effectively. Mm -hmm. So they will never meet. Okay, okay, very interesting. Okay, thank you. The what, what well, even in this in this um, so this is positive step size, so to say, right? Epsilon positive or R positive. Of course, mm -hmm. they might cross when they are very close. They might cross. But they will still never meet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but probably, if Dublin type condition is satisfied, 
then you may construct coupling very very this very good mix yes yes exactly it's it's, it's yes absolutely it's uh, this is but your constant is one and this is uh, the main stuff the you have exponent to the minus kt times uh, distance almost surely without without any additional so so you really have contraction mm -hmm. that's correct by the way you could also write so sometimes you would uh, do other couplings when you well, if we do this guy sometimes what you would want is you would want to reflect the choice that this guy has made to ultimately go in the opposite direction that's that's coupling what is called coupling by reflection mm -hmm. this this is sometimes considered when you want to really have very high mixing. It depends on what kind of estimate you want to produce. So there's choices here to make. But for these gradient estimates for the heat, uh, for the heat semigroup, this is, this is our uh, coupling of choice. So this is called coupling by parallel translation, which I have told you. Of course, there's infinitesimal versions of this, which then boils down to solving certain stochastic differential equations. But my preferred state of statement is like this. And what I just told you in the last time, this, this last example, when you do not this, the direct translation of the choice, but you reflect the choice once more relative to the plus minus direction of the two connecting lines, then this is called uh, coupling by reflection. And this, as this forces the processes to meet. Okay. Uh, Max, may I ask you one more question? Could you please show, oh, yeah. sh show us the slide with your theorem? Yes. Uh, assume that uh, the manifold is smooth. Can you apply eta formula mm -hmm. for this distance? Yes, absolutely. Yes. yes. So you have same filtration and this uh, distance has decay okay and you don't for, for and for this distance you don't have uh, like um, martingale continuous martingale part uh no because you, you you see you have distance and in the right I, hand I, you have I, 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 I show you an example okay okay I, I will pass now to the euclidean case so in the in the euclidean case it is exactly what uh okay Probably your, your problem will be, or your question will be answered after the next slide. Re, re, mm -hmm. Remind me of your question after the next slide is presented. Okay. okay. And after the next slide, you will also see why I wasted your time, because in the end, we will work on Euclidean space. <laughs> <laughs> But since, <laughs> okay. Okay, so there is a generalization of this theorem, which was proved a little later in, by, by Theo Sturm. It's, uh, it's, it's a kind of a straightforward generalization. Where now you consider the case of a Riemannian manifold, which you equip now with a weighted volume measure. And we all know that this weighted volume measure is the invariant measure for a corresponding uh, stochastic differential equation, which now also involves a gradient, uh, a gradient vector field. If, if, if we have this Gibbs type in, uh, volume measure, then there is a natural diffusion process on Rn or on the manifold, which has this measure as an invariant measure, which is just this drift diffusion equation. Yeah. So the case we considered before was the straightforward Brownian motion on Rn or on a manifold. And now we generalize this previous result to the case when we have not only Brownian motion, but we also have a real SDE with a gradient vector field. Mm -hmm. And then the statement is exactly the same as before, except now you have to adapt your concept of Ricci curvature where now you have two effects which come together. One is the curvature of the underlying space. And the second effect which comes into play is the, is the convexity of this uh, gradient potential, or, which here is the Hessian, the second order derivative. And you put these two things together. This is a quadratic tensor now. It, the Ricci thing, again, if you write it properly, is a quadratic tensor. 
And so the, the Hessian also is a quadratic form. So you say that this is greater or equal to K if it's greater or equal to K in the sense of quadratic forms. And then the statement of the previous theorem directly translates to this situation. But you have to generalize your concept of Ricci curvature, which now has two components. One is really coming from the geometry, from the curvature of the underlying space. And the other one is, so to say, is coming from the curvature of the potential, for, for the, from the curvature of the measure, if you like. And the two together give you the actual curvature. And now in this very general theory of abstract metric measure spaces, people are, have no more any distinction between the space and, and the measure. So you put all this information together, and this is then why you consider the whole thing as one big metric measure space. You have, if you like, a unified notion of curvature for a metric space which is endowed with a measure. And, and then you have a generalized concept of Ricci curvature, which is this. And you can tell it immediately from the properties of the corresponding semigroup and so forth. Okay, now coming back to the question of Andre mm -hmm. Filipenko. It's Andre, right? Is your first name, Andre? Yes. Um, so um, I will give you an answer. I hope I can give you an answer to your question before. Okay, let's consider this case here that I have been discussing. In the case when the other <laughs> manifold MG is Euclidean space. <laughs> Suppose the underlying manifold is Euclidean space, but we equip the Euclidean space with, with a non-flat measure, mm -hmm. which in other words is just to say mm -hmm. that we consider this stochastic differential equation. But now here we really have Brownian motion, white noise. Then what is this, what is this coupling here? this exponential contraction. That's not very easy. So you solve dx tx equals minus grad psi of x t dt plus dw t. And with the same realization of the Brownian motion, you solve, uh, and you start of course mm -hmm. in x. And with the same realization of Brownian motion, you uh, drive the stochastic differential equation for the y for the y process. Sorry, this is y, and this is x. You start here in x, and you start the if you like here in x. Okay, and and then. We are in a Euclidean situation, and then you just consider the, the E2 formula for the distance of the two processes. Well, you already see that the, uh, the, the Brownian motion disappears in the difference. It's the usual coupling thing. The distance solves an ODE. Mm -hmm. The distance process solves an ODE. And then Max, one more question. So it assumes that you embed your manifold into Euclidean space of higher yes. dimension. Yes. Then generally speaking, we, we have um, not DWT, but some, uh, uh, some diffusion. Yes. But uh, yes. so this Brownian motion is canceled because you make parallel transportation. Yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Yes. So it's trivial, but, but okay. Well, you have to do the, the, the Riemannian calculations in the end still, because you have to, well, in the flat case, let me just finish this line here. So if you do the Ito formula, you get minus, or, uh, what, yeah, minus two, red psi of x t x correction minus red psi of x t y times x t x minus x t y and now you can is a stupid lemma lemma from simple vector calculus so the, if you have a function whose hessian is greater or equal to k, k this is equivalent but to saying that red psi of position x minus red psi of position y in a product x minus y 
that this is greater or equal to k times x minus y norm squared. It's just the same. Mm. So you apply this information here and you get in, so this you get, so therefore you get this in less than two minus x t x minus y t x squared. Okay, kappa, don't forget the kappa. And then you have a Gronel lemma and so you see it has, has exponential contraction, right? So that's the easy case for Euclidean situation. Um, in the Riemannian situation, there's additional terms coming into the game and the additional terms have to be evaluated, but believe me, you get an ODE effectively, an ODE estimate for the distance process if you do parallel translation. Okay, finally, okay, so, so this is, this, this is the, this, um, uh, uh, Max, story uh, of... Before we uh, start to uh, go to other subject. Let yeah. me ask you some else question. Uh, it, it was uh, the idea maybe uh, from Molchanov uh, uh, from the 70s uh, that um, when you have a diffusion uh, in Euclid space, uh, you can consider it uh, as a diffusion in some manifold, just uh, considering uh, uh, it's generated as Laplace Beltrami operator in those manifold. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. when we uh, change uh, to diffusion uh, from the flat diffusion to this diffusion on manifold, maybe we can apply uh, your theorem and then get the same about the diffusion with uh, uh, Positive, positively defined generator. What do you think? If I understand your your question correctly, I think it is, if you like, it, it is more or less exactly what is being treated in this theorem in the case when the underlying manifold is just Euclidean space. No, 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 uh, no, no. Uh, here, uh, your uh, generator for diffusion part is just Laplacian. But uh, I am asking about the general diffusion, for example, in, flat, in the flat, let's consider a very simple diffusion operator, which is uh, diagonal, but uh, have a one and two uh, on the diagonal. Then uh, this is uh, uh, already not a Brownian motion, but yeah. we just- the Variable uh, coefficients can be hidden in the metric. So they can be translated. Yes, exactly, exactly, Jana. This is exactly my point. Then uh, we can, uh, maybe we can do the same or uh, formulate the same statement yeah, for, yeah. for flat diffusions or uh, for diffusions in the Euclid space with... Uh, Variable coefficient, diffusion. Uh, yes, with non-constant coefficients just uh, to have uh, yes. some uh, yes. coercitivity condition, yeah? Yes. Okay, right. So, right. So, if correct. Mm -hmm. If you have a, an SDE with a non-constant diffusion matrix on Euclidean space, for instance, yes, then you can interpret this as a Riemannian diffusion with a Laplace Beltrami operator, but there may be additional drift terms, which in, in, the, in the Riemannian interpretation, what you have to be, because there is some difference between a divergence and non-divergence form. Yes, operator. yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Let it be a divergence uh, operator, yeah. Okay, if it's a divergence operator, then perfect analogy, complete. So it's, it, it's, it's, mm -hmm. the only thing is that you have to check is that you have to check the Ricci curvature for this corresponding manifold. Of course, mm -hmm. that's something you have to check. And uh, you need to be lucky to have some um, information about the Ricci curvature of this, of this. Mm -hmm. but, but what you say is correct. So you can give a in geometric interpretation of this. You can come with, to the same conclusion. But this statement here, for instance, this metric which we use here, in your situation, non-constant diffusion matrix, will be, of mm -hmm. course, the metric that is associated to the intrinsic metric of this uh, non-trivial diffusion yeah, matrix, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and also you have to check the Ricci curvature of this corresponding uh, metric and so on. But, but correct. So it's, it's totally, it's, it covers this case. Okay, thank you. One more question now. Okay, now finally we talk about, let us now finally talk about a little bit of quantum mechanics. Uh, so all this was wasting your time because now we go really 
just to the Euclidean case, uh, where this is our underlying metric space, if you like, is the Euclidean case, and we equip it with a measure, as I just said. And then um, our, we, we have this concept of a Ritchie curvature. Here's a two, because by another normalization, we work with two phi here as, as a potential function. And in Euclidean case, this term is zero for m equal rd. And let me recall that the corresponding, if you like, weighted Laplace Beltrami operator will be this, this operator. So this, this will be the generator whose um, diffusion process has this measure here as the invariant measure, the canonical diffusion operator. Okay. Now I want to define, okay. <clears throat> I have to make one more general explanation. This theorem here was in a way a starting point for a lot of theory that people did with this lower Ricci curvature bounds in the most abstract situation. And everybody up to recently was studying only the case when we have a constant lower bound. There's some absolute number which gives it a constant lower bound. And only recently people have studied to investigate the question how the things change if you have a lower bound which depends on position. So you have just a function which gives a lower bound at every more position in space. And then some parts of the theory might change and some parts of the theory might not change. And of course, you can also allow for singularities. And what I want to make here with this note is that we have an example where we have an interesting geometry when you have to replace the constant by a function, if you like, the k of x, which is now space dependent. And k of x may very well be that may be in the extended real line. So it may be a function which has singularities, mm -hmm. but the singularities should not be too wild. Namely, I want that this whole function k will be in the Cato class. I mean, um, people who are familiar with spectral theory and they probably know what Cato class is, but I will announce it, I will, um, I will tell it in a second. Okay. Max, uh, can I interrupt you again? Because of course, actually, my question: uh, when I uh, uh, see this um, condition on the curvature, because at least for two-dimensional manifolds in uh, three-dimensional Euclid space, there are some theorems that says yeah. that if it has uh, positive uh, house curvature, uh, then it must be closer to uh, like something. Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, so maybe uh, when you uh, discuss this um, uh, modified condition, this kx, which is positive but depend on the x, uh, you you have to to present some new manifolds uh, to us, uh, which satisfy such property. Uh, yes. Which no, not not like uh, uh, spheres. Yeah. Uh, Very good question. Very good question. Very good question. Yes. So I will present to you a manifold. It's exactly my point. I will demonstrate to you that there is an interesting manifold which appears from quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. which is exactly in this in this generalized uh, bound, bounded in this generalized curvature bounded case. However, the, the, the underlying space is the flat Euclidean space. There will be no change in the space, but the, the weight, so to say, the weighting function will, be, will have the singularity. So I was trying to convince you with this slide that if you take the abstract perspective, the curvature of the full space is jointly determined by the curvature of the space itself plus the curvature of the potential, or the curvature of the measure, as the people say. And I will present to you now an example, which is flat space, but with a singular measure, which mm -hmm. satisfies this condition in the, in, the, in the generalized sense, as it is written here, but with a K, which is a, a possibly singular function. Well, for the people who study this theory, they would, they would fully accept this as, a, as an interesting generalization because they, don't, they try to set up a theory which does not distinguish between the different sources of curvature. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, but, okay, but, um, okay, but I, I don't wanna be so cheap. I don't wanna be so cheap in as answering your question. So, um, 
um, it's not fully, it's not, <clears throat> this is one class of examples which I dealt with in my PhD thesis a long time ago. It's not quite the case that you are asking, but still. So this is this, the surface of a cube, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Is what is called an Alexandrov space with positive curvature. It has curvature zero everywhere except in singular points. Mm -hmm. where curvature is plus infinity. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. That's, that's an example. So you can do some of these results uh, carry over to, to such a situation. Okay, thank you. But now in, my, my, in, in, in quantum mechanics, here in our application to quantum mechanics, we deal with Euclidean space only, but we work with weighted, with weighted measures, which then will satisfy this condition. Okay, what does it mean for a function to be in the Cato class? So assume you have <clears throat> a manifold or whatsoever, a weighted manifold, and you have a corresponding heat semigroup on this manifold. Let me specify once more what I, what I consider as a heat semigroup. So here I write delta phi. And if I write e to the s delta phi, I mean the heat semigroup, which is generated by this operator. It's just my notation here for, for heat semigroup. And delta phi in this case will be uh, uh, one half or not Laplace operator, Laplace Bertrami operator plus uh, the gradient correction, minus the gradient of the potential phi. So the typical drift diffusion equation. This is the canonical diffusion on this weighted manifold. And so I call a, a function in the Cato class. So W is in the Cato class. If, I don't like this, the first line by the way, I erase it when I give this talk. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I call a function W in the Cato class if the application, or let me write it differently. So I call this P phi T of W at position X, correction, mm -hmm. integral from zero to T DS. If this supremum overall initial positions from my manifold, if you like, if that tends to zero uniformly, and if T goes to zero. This is the Cato class condition. But this is, um, uh, this looks like W functions from the exactly, exactly, yeah. and there is it looks a like what? big connection, W functions. Actually, your notation W is very good. I see. <laughs> and there is very big connection between these uh, functions and continuous additive functionals. Oh yes, absolutely. You will see this. We need it. Okay, so I think I can, for you, and I, I can straight away jump to the last <laughs> slide. <laughs> okay, I will use the Chasminsky lemma at some point. Mm -hmm. Obviously, right? I will use this lemma. So this very so everybody's familiar with. I can save a lot of time. What original projections were 2.2 billion. We're adding to 60,000, 70,000 smarts or maybe one person. There's Donald Trump talking in the background, I think. That's really annoying to be disturbed by Donald Trump. That's really annoying. Yes. Laughing the world on testing and the world is okay. As I said, they come and say, what are you doing? How do you Right, oh. thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, um, so you're familiar with this. So in Euclidean space, if you work with a flat Euclidean heat kernel, then uh, if the function W is sufficiently integrable, then it will be in the Cato class. Yeah. So it's an application of, uh, of Hilda's inequality and using the integrability of the heat kernel. Okay, now what's the connection to quantum mechanics? <clears throat> I study um, the quantum mechanic, the, the Schrodinger semigroup, which is connected to a, to a molecule, which has what? Which has N different electrons, which live in three-dimensional space. So the state space of this system is R uh, to the three N. And these molecules, they also see some nuclei, which sit in, so we have, um, M nuclei, we have N molecules, 
we have like, if you like, M charges, which sit in Euclidean space. And so the whole potential for this um, quantum mechanical system is the potential, the electrostatic potential, which comes from this collection of nuclei, where Rj is the position of the nuclei J, nucleus j and z is the charge of the nucleus j and then we have of course the mean field self interaction of this collection of electrons that's um, a, a kind of simple model for a, um, as i said for a molecule which has n electrons and n nuclei and in schrodinger and in quantum mechanics you study this uh, schrodinger operator and you want to say something about the semi-group that comes from this operator because it describes the, the, the quantum mechanical system and so forth. So this is a Schrodinger operator. I mean, I'm, I'm not a mathematical physicist, but this is fundamentally not a diffusion operator. Uh, so um, Jana knows that very well. This is fundamentally not a diffusion operator. Um, so we have no direct stochastic representation of the semi-group if we don't, well, and now there is um, this, what is called the ground state transformation, which relates this operator to a diffusion operator. So we consider the, the ground state of this uh, molecule, which is the uh, function which uh, minimizes, if you like, the energy among all non-trivial functions. So there will be a smallest eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian operator on L2 space. And this uh, comes with, a, with an eigenvector with a function which satisfies this eigenvalue uh, estimate or this eigenvalue statement and this function will be um, a positive and uh, that's probably not true by the way um, and what I will do now I will perform this what is called the ground state transformation with this ground state to obtain a drift diffusion operator before we come back to this before we come back to this slide before we come back to the properties of the ground state, in this particular case, let me just tell you or remind you uh, what the ground state transformation is. And can I pass to a weighted Euclidean space? Uh, the weighted Euclidean space uh, is the space, wait a second, um, sorry. Okay, let's go step by step. Okay, we have the ground state psi tilde. We have psi tilde, which is the ground state, which is positive, right? Mm -hmm. And then we take the logarithm of the ground state, and we take the negative logarithm of the ground state, and this will be our potential, which we will use for the definition of a weighted Euclidean space. Mm -hmm. So in a way we construct a metric, we construct a metric measure space using the ground state, the logarithm of the ground state of the Schrodinger operator. Mm -hmm. And why do we do that? Why is that economical thing to do? Because there is this, um, what is called the ground state transformation because of the corresponding two semi, we have two semi groups which are unitarily equivalent. We have on the one hand, the conventional Schrodinger semigroup or the conventional Schrodinger operator, the thing that the people study in quantum mechanics. And on the other hand, we have a drift diffusion operator, which is of the type that I had just introduced, which I had discussed in the beginning of my talk. We have a drift diffusion operator, which comes from this gradient potential psi. So this guy here is related to an SDE. And this guy here is not related to an SDE. But the two spin groups are the same through a transformation. I think some people also call it more or less the Duke transform, but here in this context, it's called the ground state transformation. You do a Duke transform, which is basically multiplying by this e to the minus psi, uh, applying your drift diffusion operator. Where is it? Here, a uh, correction. Uh, right, so if you want to uh, relate the two, you multiply with this uh, exponential of the, of the log of the ground state, you apply the Schrodinger operator, and this is the same as if you do the function alone, apply the drift diffusion operator, and then do this uh, uh, log exponential log transformation. Mm -hmm. 
This is an operation which is a unitary isomorphism between two L2 spaces. One is the flat L2 space. This is the L2 space for the conventional Schrödinger world. And this L2 space is the weighted L2 space where the weight function is exactly our logarithmic uh, potential of the ground state. So this thing here is a classical thing in quantum mechanics. People don't use it too much, but we want to show that it's actually really useful. Well, in our case, we really make use of it. Okay, so let me say it again. <clears throat> we have we have a we have a nucleus. A correction. We have a quantum mechanical system which consists of a couple of electrons and a couple of nuclei. We consider the ground state. We do the dupe or ground state transformation with this ground state and obtain a metric measure space, which is a which is a weighted Euclidean space. And the semigroup that is induced in this from this corresponding drift diffusion operator, which is this guy here, is in terms of unitary equivalence, same as the Schrödinger semigroup. But here we can study this operator using SDE methods. And if you like Maivan calculus and whatever. And what we will also use is the fact that the corresponding um, potential here is really uh, of Cato Clyde. So now comes my main result. And this result basically is a statement about the object that I, that I study or the object that I see after I did the ground state transformation. Mm -hmm. so, in, so, in, so in a way, I'm done with quantum mechanics already. I'm done with quantum mechanics. I already left it again because I'm back in my metric measure spaces mm -hmm. using the ground state transformation. And what I want to, the statement that I want to make is the following, that the Ricci curvature, if you like this weighted Ricci curvature, mm -hmm. um, is bounded from above or in absolute value is bounded from above by a function which has singularities at certain positions in space so i'm having i'm having a ricci curvature bound which is um, in absolute value so to say but it has an upper bound which can have values of plus infinity at certain locations in space mm -hmm. but but this upper bound function is in the corresponding Cato class of this geometry that i'm working with mm -hmm. And therefore, I have a chance to really do reasonable stochasticity in, in, this, uh, in this situation. And in particular, okay, first little example, the little consequence is that this metric measure space is stochastically complete. Okay, fine. But secondly, I have a heat kernel estimate for this, uh, for this um, new object, which is very similar to heat kernel estimates that we would also have in the smooth situation. Where this function C2 here is a function which uh, this, this constant here is a constant which really uh, is imported from this Cato class property of the singularity. Okay, let me probably because negative. time is. Excuse me? Is C2 negative? Uh, I don't understand. What is C2? No, no, no. C2 is positive. So this is not a contraction estimate, but it's a non explosion statement. Uh. Also, uh, uh, I have another question. Uh, here you use uh, Euclid distance, but uh, before you formulate uh, the main theorem in the terms of uh, distance uh, related yeah. to the uh, Ricci curvature, uh, does uh, it possible uh, now to prove that uh, there is some equivalence or something? So, it is the right metric in this situation to choose because as a matter of fact, the diffusion matrix, the sigma in front of our diffusion equation is just a constant one matrix. Mm, the see. operator that we deal with, so it's just the exact the right metric at this, in this situation. Mm -hmm. okay. We call that the metric measure space, so therefore I'm, I have to apologize. Really, I wasted your time with all this geometry business. The metric measure, so the metric space here is Euclidean space, but we have a weighted measure we have not flat Lebesgue measure, we have a weighted measure. So the, the, the distance is, is just Euclidean. Mm, I see, I see, I see. Okay. And this okay. uh, t, uh, t minus one half uh, arises uh, as a um, uh, consequence of this uh, round state transformation, yeah? Yes, exactly, yeah. 
Oh, well, no, sorry, sorry. Let, let me I think I'm not really correct here. Uh, okay, I should. <clears throat> Um, okay, so there's one thing I think that I did not say correctly. Let me let me say it again. I think uh, the first statement that I made when I quoted my own result was not quite correct, and I'm, at the moment I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I have to apologize. Whether this. Uh, makes this enormous difference. So, um, I, I, I think this is exactly the point here. So my mistake here was that here I need to write the Lipschitz constant of the function f. So this is if f is in Lipschitz. So then this is how the Lipschitz constant I see is, it, I see. is being contained. If I assume only f infinity here, then I would get the one over square root t here in front as well. Uh, I think that's the point here. So it's the same kind of, yeah, I think that's the same kind of, um, in the end, it's kind of, morally, it should be the same estimate. But but I I, I think I, I have to, <laughs> your question was very good. Uh, so I, no, okay. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, in this case, uh, if you lost this uh, uh, Lipschitz condition for F, mm. uh, then, yeah. Uh, is it possible to have uh, this uh, t minus one half in any dimension, or, uh, or because usually yes, it's true. Yes. Made, uh, yeah. This this t minus one half is is correct in any dimension. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's in any dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, but 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 you're right. I think. <laughs> I should um, give it a, a second look whether it is really true, but the proof that I will could present to you mm -hmm. produces this this uh, this estimate, and so I always I, everyone has his f favorite estimate in a way that he or she can do. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I do this estimate, and so uh, but my co-author told me that this is exactly the estimate that we should get, but but uh, unfortunately I this is the best I can say I can give you the proof for this. But I cannot really tell you whether this is um, whether it makes sense. <laughs> I think it's true, but I cannot tell you whether it makes sense. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Let, let's probably do have Lipschitz constant, okay. Lipschitz constant in the right hand side. Is it correct? Lipschitz constant of f. Yes. Uh, no. Here, I'm sorry. There's a misprint here. Here, in this estimate, I really only have the infinity. That's important. Here, in the estimate, I, oh, okay. I, I only have really the l infinity. So in this case, it is weaker regarding the conditions on f mm -hmm. than the statement that I had before. That's my point that I wanted to make. So the, I think I misstated my own result from 2005. Mm -hmm. My result from 2005 has to put the Lipschitz constant here. And I was trying to make the point that this explains why I don't have the one over square root of t here in front. Mm -hmm. Because I'm assuming more on f. Mm, I see. My assumption on f here is stronger than the assumption on f that I want to make in the, the other statement. And I think um, in, in, I would have a similar statement. Well, let me say it again. Here I'm assuming only L infinity on f and not Lipschitz. So uh, it, it looks like you can do some integration by part with respect to uh, phase uh, variable. Absolutely yeah. correct. So let me give you right. So give me if you give me two minutes, I give you the essential argument. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I I was late, so I apologize again. So you can continue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to show you the. Um, I want to show you the uh, the important step in the statement <clears throat> in the proof. So the key to prove this is what is called the Bismuth derivative formula. So this is now from, I show you now the paper, obviously. Here is the Bismuth derivative formula, which is some way of an integration by parts on path space. It's this formula here. Mm -hmm. 
So this is about the gradient of the heat semigroup. D is for the derivative of the, oh, the, the resolution is bad. Okay. So it's the resolution, it's the, it's the derivative of the heat semigroup. So probably I, um, um, sorry. So this is, you, you take the corresponding semigroup, which is induced from the drift diffusion equation, right? Psi is now our potential psi. You have this red, the drift diffusion equation from the time. So you have the heat semigroup. This is, you apply it to a function f and you take the gradient of this. And you apply the gradient to a vector v. And then you have a stochastic representation of this derivative yeah. through, an, through an integral of half space, mm -hmm. or, which does not involve the gradient of the function f alone, and which involves only uh, well, some, some uh, expectation of Brownian motion. Mm -hmm. This is what is called the Bismuth derivative formula. And if you, and what is Q here? Q here is a correction term. So in the, I should probably say, in the case when, um, in case when you have just Brownian motion, then here you would just have Brownian motion. This would be a conventional integration by parts formula as in uh, my other calculus. Suppose mm -hmm. you have no potential, then this is just precisely integration by parts on, on path space. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you have a drift diffusion equation, which involves, so if, you, if you're dealing with such an equation, you basically get the same formula, but you have to, you have to include a correction term, mm -hmm. which is a, which is a, 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 a matrix valued uh, differential equation, which compensates for the additional effect, which is coming from the potential. So you have an additional multiplicative functional, in a way. Mm -hmm. And what you have to, and so in your derivative formula, you have a multiplicative functional, uh, which exactly compensates uh, the additional term. Mm -hmm. And now, but here you are in business because, because in this in this point you can uh, do uh, basically um, Hilda's inequality and uh, L two isometry and all these kind of things, such that in the end you end up with an expectation which involves an exponential, an exponential um, expression here. Mm -hmm. So this is how it comes, right? You do some Hilda inequalities that gives you the square root of T or, um, well, by the way, there is, you have, okay. That's probably, too, you make a particular choice. So here we have a degree of freedom regarding a certain control variable L. Mm -hmm. So if we choose the control variable L right, then we end up with this estimate where in the end we have to take an exponential, the expectation of an exponential where this k function here is basically this um, function which bounds the Ricci curvature. And uh, last step is that this expectation here is finite because k epsilon is in this, um, is in this Cato class. And, uh, and the finiteness of, uh, of this ex expectation of this uh, exponential is then a consequence of the, of the Chasminski lemma. Mm -hmm. yeah. So whenever you have a function here, which is in this Cato class, when K epsilon is a Cato class function, then you have an estimate of this type due, due to this, this Chasminski lemma, which gives a, a bounds for the exponential of such, uh, such uh, such properties. Okay, this was very quick in the end, and I probably apologize that I couldn't deliver the technical details in full, in full flavor, but if you want, I can discuss in private with anyone of you who wants to have the details. Okay, let me, so let me wrap up, let me wrap up. Let me go back. Let me go back to my slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have, we have seen that through, when we apply this ground state transformation for a molecule, we end up with a weighted Euclidean space, which has a weighted measure, 
which is an example, if you like, of such a generalized metric space with a generalized lower Ricci curvature, which not at this point will be no longer, will no longer have a Ricci curvature, which is bounded uniformly, but which is uniformly, which is bounded by a function, which depends on position. This function has singularities, but the singularities are controlled. They are in this Capo class. And as a consequence of this, uh, of this still controllable degeneracy of the curvature, we still get reasonable uh, gradient estimates uh, for the course. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, maybe somebody have a question or, or comments, please. Uh, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. At so, uh, as I understand, this example shows that in the case when we don't have the uniform uh, bound of Ricci curvature, still we can control the, the increments of heat semigroup. Yes. Uh, but still, if you are this, uh, ask the same question in general, uh, for uh, in general case, uh, whether also you will have a chance to control the uh, the uh, uh, the increments of heat semigroup because. I want to understand how much uh, comes from the particular choice of the model. Whether you need to add some additional conditions or it is only enough to control the Ricci curvature from below by some function, which, would, which, which behaves more or less good. Uh, okay. Um, so the, there are examples of manifolds, which you, if you like, which have, uh, which, degenerate which develop singularities which develop curvature minus infinity at so many places that uh, you have no more control of Brownian trajectories. So if you have absolutely no information on lower curvature then uh, there's very little you will be able to say in the very general situation. But can you subtract some property from this model which you have to, to conclude that okay if we add some additional conditions then we can control the increments. Okay, yes, exactly. So, to, to, to be, so, so what we know is that some people try to develop a full general theory as like sh the people Sturm and so forth. So Sturm has announced, and I should say, I, I know this only after this project was finished, but Sturm has announced a paper where he gives full theory for the case when you have a very, very abstract metric space with this lower Ricci curvature in the Cato class. So he has a claim that many, many things work well in the very abstract situation. However, this, he announced this already a long time ago and the paper is not yet there. So we don't know. Uh, but what we can show here. So, so, yeah, so, but, but here we give an example which is not fictitious. We give a very concrete example of a molecule, of a, of, a, of a quantum mechanical system, when you can really prove interesting things which are relevant in physics. And, and so, so, we, so therefore we think that even if Storm is able to give a full theory, we still have an interesting example where this theory, if you like, applies. But at the moment, we cannot really say how much, how much this can be generalized to general situations. But uh, of course, we. We, we are working on this and try to, to um, find this out. But in this regard, we are in competition with, with Sturm and others. Uh, also, I think that uh, in, uh, in your model, the uh, one important thing is the statement. Uh, you say that this is known, uh, that uh, there is this ground state with uh, good properties, yeah? Yes, yes. yes it is an yes. important thing. And, yes, uh, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely correct. So in, in a way it says that all the information about the semi-group or a lot, a lot of information in the, in the, in the, in the whole semi-group is encoded in the properties of the ground state. So if you have a good, good ground state, then the whole semi-group is basically very good. Uh, also, uh, let me uh, ask you, uh, can you use uh, obtained estimation to get estimation for the heat kernel uh, now, uh, for, for the uh, density of this diffusion. Yes, uh, we haven't looked into it, but I think, I think this, this kind of argument uh, is, 
of this, there is a, there is, I think there is an open path now for a collection of arguments that we can apply here. Yeah. Uh, you see, I, I ask you this question because it is uh, closely related uh, again to the uh, understanding of simultaneous behavior of independent Brownian motion on this manifold or so on. But mm -hmm. Uh, in hyperbolic case, uh, there is a, a lot of um, works of uh, Peter Fries, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. Uh, he, he is doing uh, uh, estimation of heat kernels in uh, hyperbolic case. Uh, I see. And, and, and he gets uh, I see. Some, some estimation. I see, I see, I see. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, some other questions, please. If there are no any questions uh, else, uh, then thank you again. It was interesting and informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next session will be after two weeks, I think, after two weeks, and you will get uh, an announcement uh, by email. Thank you.